Sunday, November 9th, midnight, is Frederick Lowen interviewing Kevin Hinchy, co-director of the Reich Infant Trust, and we're discussing his film project on Wilhelm Reich. Kevin, why do you believe Reich's work has been ignored as it has been? I think it's been ignored uh, uh, largely because of all the uh, prevalent widespread distortions about him, which began during his lifetime and have certainly um, increased, uh, I would say, after his death. And so what I see every time um, uh, I try to talk to, to um, uh, various uh, people about Reich in terms of fundraising or filmmaking or academically, these, these distortions about Reich, they precede us everywhere. And um, they're out there. And today, with the, uh, with the Internet, um, oftentimes I can have an intelligent conversation with someone uh, who knows little or nothing about Reich. That's the first conversation. The second conversation, which could be a few days later, is considerably different because they've decided to do their own research about Reich on the Internet, and they come across all of the usual distortions. And so, because these, these distortions precede us everywhere, they're on the Internet, they're in films, they're in books, they're in academic publications, it's hard, uh, really, to get people to... Uh, seriously consider um, uh, uh, a lot of things about Reich and I've certainly found that um, just in pursuit of this film project in the last few years. What do you think the source of these lies and distortions are? Do you have an idea as to why Reich experienced such difficulty in getting his ideas out where other scientists are not so persecuted and distorted? Um, I think a lot of this has to do with the fact uh, that Reich's work is rooted in uh, psychoanalysis um, and specifically in, uh, in human sexuality and um, you start to see the um, you start to see the uh, really the beginnings of the distortions about Reich, the slanders about Reich. They begin in the psychoanalytic community, going back to the early 30s, and um, I think a lot of this uh, has to do with um, um, perhaps legit legitimate intellectual differences. I think there's a lot of ego involved, a lot of competitiveness a lot of personal uh, conflicts going on, but um, a lot of the distortions we hear about Reich go all the way back to the early 30s in terms of the conflicts he was having with his fellow psychoanalysts. And as he moves into different areas in terms of biology, in terms of, uh, oh, oh, no, and also his, his political activities, you start to see these animosities and these conflicts and, uh, um, and, and as well as legitimate differences of opinion all seem to coalesce into what I often call distorted narratives about Reich. Why do you think that it took so long for a project of this type to begin to take root, considering the work that Reich did and the lies and distortions that came about in the wake of that work. Um, you got me on that one because there have been so many opportunities for filmmakers to do exactly what I'm trying to do and that is to to put forth into the world a factually accurate narrative of Reich. There have been numerous films about Reich there have been numerous television productions about Reich um, from admirers and detractors alike. Um, in my position as uh, a co-director of the Wilhelm Reich Infant Trust, I've had contact 
with a lot of these people. And what I've noticed from the filmmakers that I've met, but also the ones that I haven't met, um, none of them seem to have done legitimate, adequate research into the facts about Reich's life and legacy. Um, it seems to me that people are eager to make a film. They're eager to seek other people's opinions about Reich as the basis for their narratives. But I have not come, I'm not aware, nor have I personally come across anyone doing what I'm doing, and yet any of them could have done it. There are over 7,000 pages of Reich's publications that are publicly available, 23, 22 books, um, as well as the reprints of all of his, uh, of his uh, published research journals. Um, this is where the story is. Um, all you have to do is read these materials, spend the time reading these materials, which takes years, and connect the dots from all the facts. Um, you need to read a lot of other primary resources. You need to read original government files, which I've done, State Department, FBI, Immigration and Naturalization Service, and of course the FDA. Um, these are all available. And so why someone hasn't done this before, I think is out of sheer um, intellectual laziness is all I can say. Um, because like I say, anyone could have done the work that I'm doing and that was a decision not to. <clears throat> what is your personal connection, Kevin, with Wilhelm Reich and his work? Yeah, I, 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 I think I came to Reich in a rather uh, unusual um, way, uh, perhaps a little bit more unusual than a lot of people. Um, when I was a child, my family vacationed regularly in the town of Rangeley, Maine, which is where Reich had his research and laboratory. And when I was a child, this was the Wilhelm Reich Museum. And so um, we never visited the museum when I was a kid, but we would see the signs for Wilhelm Reich. Uh, I had no idea what it was all about. But as I got older, I, um, I took a, a, a great deal of interest in a lot of Rangeley history because it was an area that I really loved a lot and I was interested in finding out a lot about Rangeley. But it wasn't until I was 18 um, that I was up there camping and I learned from a couple of college students in the next campground um, who had come up specifically to see the Wilhelm Reich Museum who Wilhelm Reich was. And from what they told me it sounded very interesting and within the next few days on a rainy day when there was uh, not much else to do, I went to the Rangeley Library, um, and, and I read. And what year was this, Kevin? Oh, this uh, this was in August of uh, this was in August of 1972. I was just about to start my uh, sophomore year of college. I was 18 years old, and um, and I was an English major. But um, uh, what these students told me was very interesting about Reich. And so I went to the library a few days later, and um, the first uh, book that I ever read having to do with Reich uh, was Reich Speaks of Freud, which was an interview that Reich had given with a uh, representative of the uh, Freud archives in the early 1950s. And I found that this was an excellent and very compelling introduction to Reich. And the idea that he was um, associated with the town of Rangeley was very compelling to me. But I was very impressed uh, w w with the breadth of his work, from psychoanalysis uh, into, into uh, social and political activities, into the area of biology and medicine and cancer research. And from that point on, I started reading one book by Reich after another. Not books, by, not books that someone else had written. I just kept reading every, any book that I could get my hand on written by Reich, and within a few years I had read all of it. Mm -hmm. And um, it's just an area of study that, that I have continued until this day, over 40 years later. Well, it's interesting because 
most people who are associated with Reich and follow Reich's work are from the field of psychotherapy, but mm. uh, uh, you seem to have come at it from a completely different and outside perspective. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, and um, I, I, whether that's been an advantage or disadvantage, uh, I don't know. Um, but I am aware that I, uh, keenly aware, that I didn't come to Reich um, from the world of psychology or psychoanalysis, nor from the area of, 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 of European history or European politics. I kind of came at it from a different point of view. Um, and I think it's, it's lent kind of an interesting perspective for me. Um, and I hope that that's, you know, that that will be manifested in the, uh, in the film that I've, that I've researched and written and now want to produce. In your research and your study of Reich over the decades now, what do you feel are Reich's most important contributions? Well, I, I, um... I think there are a lot of contributions that Reich made that have taken root, and I think that there are other contributions um, which haven't take root, which haven't taken root. Um, Reich was one of the um, uh, early members of the uh, uh, the technical seminar for psychoanalytic technique, um, which was founded by Freud at Reich's suggestion, and. Um, this was a, a, a seminar uh, in the 1920s in which they were really trying to standardize psychoanalytic uh, techniques. And um, Reich was a, major, uh, was a major contributor to this technique and a director of it um, for, I believe, six years from 1924 to 1930 uh, when he moved to Berlin. And so Reich was a key figure in helping to standardize psychoanalytic technique. Um, and so I see that possibly as one of his most lasting contributions which hasn't taken root. The second one, which I also believe has taken, uh, taken root in a, uh, in a significant way, are a lot of what we might call today the mind-body ther therapies. And... Um, uh, which at least some of the principles, uh, knowingly or unknowingly, I, I, I don't know, um, have, have, have probably evolved from vegetotherapy, which um, was a th therapeutic techniques that Reich developed, which grew out of psychoanalysis and which were um, really paying attention to, to, um, to, to what he called muscular armor. And so I think a lot of these, what you might call mind-body therapies, which are focusing on, on, um, on, 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 on the unity of the mind and body, are deeply rooted in, um, in, in Reich's therapeutic uh, principles. Um, I think if you read Reich's uh, literature in terms of his biological work, in which he was uh, using microscopes with higher magnifications than most people were using at the time um, and he discovered uh, microorganisms which he felt held uh, uh, could perhaps hold the key to the development of cancer cells. I think this is a major contribution that Reich made but I in, in terms of promising area of future research because these contributions in terms of cellular research and cancer research are in his books, they're documented in his books, they're in his laboratory notebooks. Um, they lead the way to him doing experimental cancer research, they lead to his discovery of a radiation um, that he calls orgone energy emanating from these microscopic cultures. But these contributions have largely been dismissed or, un un or unknown to the traditional uh, medical and scientific communities, and I think um, they hold terrific promise, and I think um, there needs to be more attention on understanding these parts of his legacy. 
in my view, Kevin, Reich's work centered on energy and the energetic processes of human beings and all living systems. While he covered a lot of ground, first in psychoanalysis and then biology and then in the physical sciences, would you agree that the common denominator in all of his work was a study of energy? Yeah, that, yeah, that, that, that's an excellent point. Um, all of Reich's work in psychoanalysis, in, uh, in biology, um, in, uh, in, in medicine, um, are really rooted in, in, in an energetic, uh, uh, energetic processes based on, based on Freud's um, concept of the libido. And uh, Freud, uh, uh, for quite a period of time, believed that the libido might in fact be a tangible biological energy. Um, this was an idea that he would later abandon. Um, but Reich was very impressed by, um, uh, by these early scientific concepts of Freud and, and, and he continued and, and he pursued them. So the study of energy in the human organism in terms of its, uh, in terms of, uh, of both physical processes and psychic processes um, is a very important part of his early work. The study of energy principles in, in some of the most basic life forms, protozoa and amoeba, um, uh, led Reich eventually into cancer studies. Um, and then later in his atmospheric work, in his cancer uh, work, um, these study of energetic principles are crucial, and we're not talking about a psychological idea. We are talking about a tangible biological energy, um, which Reich first discovered in these microorganisms under high magnification, and would later discover the same energy, the same physical energy in the atmosphere, and it was this energy that Reich would call orgone energy, and um... Yeah, no, very good, very good. I uh, uh, believe that's uh, true, and I agree with that as well. Um, <clears throat> oh, and I was just... I lost the trend of my thought after midnight. It <laughs> gets tough to... <laughs> and we can edit, edit this portion out. Um, but what I was going to... The follow-up question I wanted to ask here... Um, I think the uh, discussion about the microscopic work that Reich did is very telling and illustrates really the difference that Reich had in his scientific biological investigations. As I understand it, the reason that he used microscopes of such high magnification was because he was not interested in the structure and the detail of the living organisms that he was looking at, which of course is what modern science is principally interested in. Reich was interested in movement and the energy that drives that movement associated with these living organisms. And to see that movement and to understand the energetic processes behind that, Reich used microscopy. His microscopes were used at such high magnifications that his work was dismissed by people who didn't understand that really what he was interested in was energy and movement and not structure and detail. Right. 
just to be clear, of course he was interested in structure and detail, but in addition to the structure and detail, he was very interested in the energy. That's right. No, no, I think it's a very accurate description. And, um, um, and, and to study movement, to study energy, you need to, be, you need to study tissues that are living. So Reich was not, was not studying uh, exclusively stained tissues. He was studying living matter, living cancer tissues, living cells um, under high magnifications where he could actually see movement within, within these living tissues. Now, that's something that was rather unusual at the time. Um, I'm a little unclear as to how unusual it is today, but one of the things that I've always enjoyed about Reich's writing is he will explain some of his principles and he will be and he will come back to them almost like refrains. He will he'll go into detail, he'll explain things, and he is constantly stressing in his scientific writings and I'm thinking specifically about the Bion experiments uh, on the origin of life and the cancer biopathy, the importance of studying living tissue under high magnifications. Um, now interestingly, um, in addition to actually um, being able to see energy movements, under these high magnifications he did discover um, microorganisms um, which had some sort of effect on the development of cancer. So these high magnifications, and we're talking about 25, 25x magnifications, 3000x, 4000x, were unusual magnifications at the time, um, but Reich is consistently um, in, uh, insisting on, uh, uh, on them. And when people would study with him in his laboratories in Oslo, in New York City, and, uh, and in Rangeley, um, people needed to be trained and to get used to looking at living substances at high magnifications. The other thing that Reich was doing here, and he was one of the, had to have been one of the early proponents of it, certainly not the first, was he was attaching um, motion picture cameras to these high magnification microscopes and taking time-lapse films. And so among the, um, the many archival materials we have are hours and hours and hours of original uh, uh, laboratory films, time-lapse films, shot with motion picture cameras attached to high magnification microscopes. It's interesting that you talk about the importance of studying living tissue. That's something that my dad, Alexander Lowen, mm. always pointed out was that all the scientific work of the day was necessarily done on dead tissue, yeah. as you point out. What's exciting to me now in this 21st century is that technology has provided some tools whereby we can do with many of the imaging techniques much of this work actually on living tissues like the obvious the MRI magnetic resonance uh, studies um, <clears throat> and I'm very optimistic that this technology married with some of Reich's work from nearly a hundred years ago, 80 and a hundred years ago, can yield some very interesting results. Uh, and again, it's interesting that you make the distinction between needing to study living tissue to understand the energy and the energetic processes compared to the dead tissue which much of modern science is built on as they study again the structure and the detail. Now, let me ask you, um, <clears throat> why, why should we be interested in Reich? What contributions do you feel 
are relevant to today, uh, it is my belief that Reich's work has much application today. It's not just a matter of history. I, I, I agree. I agree completely. I think, uh, I think the breadth of Reich's work is astounding. And I think in terms of uh, contributions for today, um, his contributions in terms of psychoanalysis, uh, in terms of helping to standardize technique, um, will always be valuable. His, his contributions in terms of so many of these, uh, what we might call mind-body techniques, are always going to be valuable. But let's look at some of the contributions which are documented in his books and laboratory notebooks, uh, uh, but which haven't really taken root in the world, largely because they've been dismissed and and um, are no longer and uh, are not really well known because of these distorted narratives. Um, his biological research, his discovery of microorganisms uh, with a physical energy radiating from them that he called orgone energy are quite significant in terms of their applications for the study and treatment of cancer. Um, it's through his biological work that Reich moves on into cancer research. His, um, his, uh, his experimental treatments of, of patients with cancer and other diseases um, by the use of his principal medical and scientific tool called the orgone accumulator uh, need to be explored more. Um, his promising results are documented in his books, in his notebooks, in his laboratory notebooks, in his films. Um, and then you need to move into the area of atmospheric research. Um, and again, these are very promising results in terms of atmospheric research, um, which are very well documented, again, in notebooks and laboratory notebooks and films. So I think um, in terms of where the promise is today for his work, which traditional in medicine and science is ignoring, is in biology, cancer research and atmospheric research. I'd like to take the moment to add that from my perspective as a bioenergetics person that the study of character mm. or characterology good, yeah. in the field of psychotherapy is still an underappreciated contribution that has become a mainstay in much of psychiatric understanding, uh, although I'm afraid that even many professionals are unaware that Reich was really the genesis of the full-blown characterology. Mm -hmm. I'm proud to say that my dad, Alexander Lowen, contributed significantly to the completion of that work, but Reich, in his book of character analysis, uh, fully laid out the basic groundwork and energetic functioning that led to the understanding of character, which my dad, over 50 years of clinical work, has fully validated. Yeah, I, I, I think uh, character analysis, um, originally published in 1933, it, is, is, is a book that needs to be read by more people so people can really see the contributions of Reich in a book, the original version which was written in, in, in 1933 with several revised editions over the years and, um, and I think this holds true with, with several of Reich's books. There are 22 or 23 titles of books out today. Um, the readership of these books is unfortunately very small. And we know this by the, uh, um, by the figures and the royalty checks we get from the publisher. Um, more and more people seem to be getting their information about Reich on the internet rather than reading primary sources, rather than reading Reich's books um, uh, themselves. And um, character analysis, which I've had to read several times, 
um, in my research for this film is really a, is really a remarkable book in terms of um, of Reich's contributions to therapeutic technique, and then the later chapters in which he's moving on into, into the area into the areas of muscular armor and vegetotherapy and later orgone therapy. This is a landmark book. Um, still still considered a classic in certain circles and certainly should be a much wider read book, especially among people in psychoanalysis and psychiatry and any kind of therapeutic technique, really. And finally, just to clear up an area that I believe is controversial at its root and colors many people's impressions of Reich. Reich had a very long, varied, and prolific career as a scientist of life. And many of his theories in the later years were very difficult for people to understand. Even the early stuff is difficult to understand, but there's a obvious truth to much of it. However, in the later years, it's less clear. How would you characterize Reich's health in the last five, six, seven years of his life during the 1950s? Uh, while he was, while he was being persecuted, in fact, in a court of law, ultimately dying in American prison, how would you characterize his state of mental health and/or physical health uh, during this period? Yeah, I'm. Uh, uh, I, I'm certainly no expert on this, I'm, but I've I've read a tremendous amount of uh, primary resources on this. Um, I don't doubt, uh, for a moment, Reich's sanity um, throughout his life. Um, I believe that uh, once you start getting uh, beyond beyond the years, I would say, of 1954, when um, the decree of injunction is issued, um, I believe the pressure was building tremendously on Reich, who had faced decades of, um, uh, you know, of, of persecution and slander, um, going back to, to Austria, to Germany, to Oslo, and he comes to America and finds that this country is not as receptive uh, to his ideas as he, as he had hoped. And so I feel he was under tremendous pressure um, as anyone would be. Um, I think perhaps he, like all of us, uh, might have erred in, 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 in certain judgments and certain decisions, but I don't see any one, any one questionable uh, decision on his part or judgment on his part um, that, that would... Ex you know, that, that would explain everything that happened or that might have made things go in a different direction. I think too often people are looking at, um, at, at this period of life as if Reich made one decision and, and that was irrevoc irrevocable or if he had done this, everything would have been fine. I think it's more complicated than that. But I do feel he was under tremendous pressure. Um, in terms of his physical health, all you really have to do is look at the photographs of him uh, in, in those last, I would say, three, four years where he, he seems to change remarkably. Um, when he dies, he's 60 years old. To me, he looks like he's 80. Um, he was a heavy smoker. Um, um, appeared to gain weight in these uh, photographs. He was under tremendous legal pressure. Um, so again, 
the man was human. I think he was under tremendous pressure, but I don't see I don't see anything that indicates um, a loss of a loss of sanity. And I have never really come across any definitive documentation um, that states anything like this. There's a tremendous amount of speculation about him. Um, uh, that's about all I, I, I guess mm. I could say about that. Okay, very good, very good. I, I would just follow up because I, I personally question uh, <clears throat> whether or not in those last years in the 1950s that he had as full a grip on reality as, as you would expect. And, and I think it's certainly understandable given the history of, of his life and his interests and his brilliant mind, I think there's no question. But episodes that involved his belief that the Air Force yeah. was yeah. F overflying his house for the purpose of, of protecting him right. is an indication to me that, that he, uh, he, he did have psychotic episodes and, and by psychotic I, I refer to uh, the situation where your perception of reality is not, is not in fact what the reality right. is. I yeah. don't believe the Air Force was actually watching out for right. him at that time. Right. Uh, but as I say, I don't believe that that invalidates in any way the important work that Reich did over the many decades that, uh, that he pursued his, his intense curiosity. But in any case, I very much wish you the very best luck in working towards completing this film and I personally will support you as will the Alexander Lowen Foundation and uh, I want to thank you for your time and, uh, and your effort in this process, Kevin. Well, uh, thank you very much, Fred. You've been a, a big supporter of this, this project since we started the uh, Kickstarter campaign and um, I do think this is an important film project. I, I can't think of a of a better way to, to to put forth into the world a factually accurate narrative for widespread audiences. Lectures are wonderful. I've given many of them. Conferences are wonderful. I've been to many and organized many others. They're wonderful. Um, but I think these types of things are a little more ephemeral, a little more um, a transitory than a film documentation, a film narrative out there. And, that, and, 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 and once the film is produced, there are so many things you can do with it. It becomes a learning tool in which you can really go out into the world with this film and introduce Reich's, uh, Reich's life and work in a concise 100 to 110 minute film. Um, I wish other filmmakers had done this. Um, but none of them have done this, and I think it's of paramount importance that the world have at least one film that has been thoroughly researched and is factually accurate, uh, a factually accurate narrative of Reich. And thanks again, uh, Fred, for, for, for all of your support and the support of, uh, of all of your colleagues. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you, Kevin, and uh, good luck on the project. Thank and, you. And this is Kevin Hinchley. Hinchy. Kevin Hinchy, <laughs> co-director of the Reich Infant Trust. Thank you, Kevin. Good night. Well, how do you think?